with us now, Joe Spinotti, Sam Lubbin, and uh, Happy New Year to uh, to you, Adam. What's going on, man? Everything's good, guys. Really appreciate you guys having me on. Happy New Year to you as well. Absolutely. And uh, you were on the call, obviously, with Fox Sports alongside Mark Schlereth. And uh, big bounce back for the 49ers, obviously. Get their asses kicked on Christmas night against the Baltimore Ravens. Brock Purdy has his worst outing as a professional. How big was it? I know it's against the Commanders, but how big was it for him and his psyche and the teams that he had a clean performance in a win over the Commanders? What's the, I mean, and you guys would know better than I, I would, but, it, it, you know, there's a small enough sample size where a lot of us have kind of seen most of Brock Purdy's career at this point, right? There hasn't been a ton of, I, I hate using this word sometimes because I think it's a buzzword in sports, but sports adversity, right? There, mm. there hasn't been a lot of sports adversity for Brock just yet. The elbow injury, obviously, in the NFC title game, but it's not, you know, the loss, nobody really puts on him. They kind of put on the circumstances. So that loss against Baltimore was the first time I think a lot of people looked at Brock Purdy, even though they had that three-game losing streak earlier in the season. I think it was the first time that a lot of people were looking at him going, well, what's that all about? You know, three, inter- three interceptions, four interceptions. How, you know, how can you trust this guy if he can't play on a Christmas night uh, you know, in front of a huge audience? And that's obviously you know, how we have a tendency to overblow you know, these national and televised games. I think just the fact that he had a bad game, they reset, Kyle Shanahan was adamant that he's going to be fine, and he proved it. And I think that's all teams like the Niners who are just so talented that for the most part, based on talent alone, they're not going to run into a lot of sports adversity over the course of the season. I think even little things like this, you know, I'm sure a lot of organizations would love the type of sports adversity that the Niners deal with. Oh, they, they only scored 20 points a game for a few games, and... You know, oh, they lost one game to arguably the best team in the NFL right now, and they're you know they're the number one seed. It's not a lot of you know sports adversity. A, a lot of organizations would love to be in their position, but you need relative benchmarks of adversity. Oh no, I think we lost him. He dropped there. It's all right. It happens. We'll get Adam back there. Eight 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 nine five seven nine five seven zero. He was on a roll there though, and the adversity factor when it comes to you know, Brock Purdy and overcoming it. And to Adam's point, he hasn't really had to overcome much. And you know what? That's fine. If, if, if you're blowing out all the other teams and you have these big leads and you hang on to them, I'm cool with that as a fan. But I understand that on national TV, a lot of the United States, I mean, we saw the ratings. They dominated. Whether it was the morning, afternoon, and the night game, NFL absolutely taking the lunch of the NBA as far as ratings go. But that's neither here nor there. That's just another day for the NFL and their dominance over sports rankings. Uh, we got Adam back? All right, we got him back. Sorry, Adam, you got cut off there for a sec. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. We're, I'm, I'm up in the sky in Philadelphia right oh, now. Oh, you're we're good. At the, we're at the team hotel getting ready to go for a game tonight. But the, no, we were just talking about a lot of organizations would love to be in the position that the Niners are in, right? So you need, when you're that good of a team, you need relative benchmarks of adversity. Say, hey, remember, guys, we went through this before. We went through this losing streak. We had that bad game, and look how we were able to, you know, rally together. You need points for that. Like, you look at the Detroit Lions, they have all these different points, and the, and the game against Dallas on Saturday night is just another benchmark for Dan Campbell to be able to say, guys, we've been through this before. It's okay. So that when you're sitting in the fourth quarter of a game and you're in a huddle during a timeout with nine minutes left and you're down 13 points, you go, guys, we've been here before. Remember that game we played in week 11. Remember that horrible call that went against you. Remember the stuff that you guys have already dealt with. Like, coaches are always, and players for that matter, too, are always looking for, you know, points of emphasis and relative benchmarks that you can look back on during the course of a long season and say, we've been through this before. And that's the mental aspect of the coaching. We hear that from Kyle Shannon. I've heard that from Dan Campbell. I've heard that from Matt Eberflus in Chicago. I've heard that from coaches in every sport that I've covered. You need those benchmarks, and that's what the Niners got. So what a bounce-back performance. That's why that game was important, even though it's against the lowly commander's defense that didn't generate a whole lot of resistance. You need games like that, and you need proof of the bounce-back ability, and that's what we talked a lot about at the end of the game on Sunday. Adam, you mentioned a lot during the game that, you know, Brock, he was making throws. These are not game man, you know, game manager throws. And I remember you said that a few times. Mm-hmm. When it comes to this game manager narrative that's surrounding Brock Purdy, what do you make of it? Like, why does it still seem to persist, even though, again, you mentioned several times that's not a game manager moment? Why does that narrative still persist on him? And what does this guy have to do to shed that, that label on him? I'm not sure what he needs to do to shed it other than just keep making explosive plays. Like, 
and and it's more a problem of the narrative itself. It's not an issue of Brock Purdy. It's a problem of the narrative itself. I think it's lazy writing if you want to call stick with the narrative theme here. I, I don't like I don't like how binary we we turn that phrase right. Like it, suddenly, game manager means one thing. Either you're a game manager or you're a dynamic quarterback. And it's like, no, those, there's a lot, a lot of gray area between those two poles, right? Like if, if game manager, if all he does is throw check downs and not turn the ball over and they score points, A, first off, what's wrong with that, right? What's wrong with being a game manager? The first thing you need to be able to do as a successful quarterback in the NFL is to be able to manage a game. I don't think we've properly used that phrase or that phrase has turned into something else that it's not or that it shouldn't be. Uh, we've created this binary about it where it's just like, all right, either you're, you're this guy or you're that guy. And it's like, no, you, to be a great quarterback, you need to be both. You need to have elements of game managing, which is probably the most important part. And then you need the ability to make dynamic plays. And in a, in a year and in a league right now where quarterback play is not particularly great across the board, like really good quarterback play is at a premium right now, I feel like Brock Purdy is about as good as you're going to get right now. I, I look at Jared Goff. I, I look at Dak Prescott, who's had that label thrown on him at times. You know, regardless of what guys like Tom Brady might say or Cam Newton might say or whatever some of the you know, recently retired guys are, are saying about what they see in, in the NFL right now, being a game manager is a great, is, is, I don't know if it's a great or good thing, whatever, it's an important thing. So for Brock, he should continue to be a great game manager. He should continue to understand time, score, scenario. You should continue to understand down, distance. Under, being a game manager means you're aware of all of the elements of your game plan. And so I, I don't understand why all of a sudden it's a bad thing or why it's always been considered a bad thing. And I don't like how binary we've made that because that gray area is what makes quarterbacks really, really good. Are you capable of being dynamic? We saw some of the throws that Brock made pretty good. That, that, that throw to Ayuk is one of the best throws I've seen this season in the NFL. So I feel like he has the dynamic playability. Obviously part of that is, you have guys who can make dynamic plays, and he does. He's got Debo Samuel. He's got Ayuk. He's got Kittle. He's got McCaffrey. You know, Elijah Mitchell had a great game with some nice runs. Like, he has all the tools the same way that, like, a Tua Tunga Vailola in, in, uh, in Miami has all the tools. He's got a good offensive line. He's got explosive receivers on the outside. He's got a really productive running back, like you guys know in Raheem Mostert. So those are good things to have, and I don't understand what, you know, what he's got to do to shed the narrative. I don't think that's the issue. I think the narrative itself is more of the issue than anything else. Because Brock is playing at a great level in and combining both of those elements, the dynamic ability and the ability to make sure you're understanding the time, score, down, distance, scenario, personnel, all that stuff. Adam Amin joining us here on the Morning Rose. Spadoni and Lumman in for Bonte Hill and Joe Shasky. He was on the call for the Fox Sports as the Niners took out the Washington Commanders 27-10. to 10. And... You know, Kyle Shanahan, much has been made about him and, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo getting to the mountaintop, getting oh so close, couldn't get the job done, and obviously Kansas City winning that Super Bowl, getting to an NFC Championship, and then Sean McVay took it away from him. Adam, it does start to feel, as you look at a macro view and you just listen to the quarterbacks there, that Brock Purdy would potentially have to face. Whether it's Dak, whether it's Jared Goff, I'm looking at the quarterback and the head coach combination And, you know, outside of maybe Stafford and McVay who have won the ring and they're hot right now, so maybe that's the team no one wants to face, I'm looking at this NFC, and it's the Niners, and maybe no one isn't even close to this team right now. The way they're playing, the way the Eagles are in shambles right now, they just took a huge loss to Jonathan Gannon. I mean, is anyone on this team's level in the NFC? I don't think in the NFC. That doesn't mean they can't lose. Like, that's the the one thing you got to make sure. And and, and I know you know that, but, like, I think we we have a tendency – sometimes to be like, well, this is clearly the best team in the NFC, and then they don't win, and you're like, well, well I guess they weren't the best team. That's not necessarily true. The best team is, is judged over 17 games, over 18 weeks, and then anything can happen in the playoffs, and that's why we love it so much, because it's a one and done, and you know, whatever, what, you know, whatever bounces go your way or don't go your way are so determinant of it, and it's fun for us. It's fun for us as fans. It's fun for broadcasters. We get to enjoy kind of watching all this play out, but the best team in the NFC is the Niners. It's the most talented team. And I think 
for me, the word best usually means consistent. Like, who's the most consistent team relative to their talent level? And I think the four, like, I, like, I've seen a lot of the Atlanta Falcons this year, right? And I know it's not a great example for a team that's, that's a fringe playoff team, but they have a really talented roster. Like, it's, it's really good. Bajon Robinson's good. Tyler Algier is really good. Drake London is really good. Kyle Pitts is really good. They have two of the best offensive linemen in the game, I would say, and Chris Lindstrom and uh, Jake Matthews. Uh, their defense got better. Their, their defense has been one of the best-ranked defenses in the NFL this year. They've done a really good job. And the quarterback is the issue, right? So Arthur Smith gets criticized for some of the way, or so you know, some of the ways that his games have played out relative to his talent level. So we don't really look at the Falcons as a threat because their quarterback plays too bad, and Arthur Smith gets a lot of criticism for him, probably rightfully so. He's and he's a big boy. I don't think he would scoff at me saying that. Kyle Shanahan, the Niners, Steve Wilkes, they have a high talent level. So what is the expectation? You, ha- you better be the best team in the league. And for me, best means consistent, and they're the most consistent team. They make the fewest mistakes. The, the, when they do make mistakes, it's surprising. You know, that's why that Monday night game was so shocking, because we're not used to seeing Brock Purdy make the type of mistakes that he was making. And again, some of those are just bad bounces. You know, the, tip, the two tip balls in the air, you know, some of the you know, one bad route, all, and all of a sudden he's got three quick turnovers, and the Baltimore's credit, they took advantage of him. Fred Warner told us on Saturday when before the, the commander's game, like, if we take the ball away two times, I think we win that game. You know, we help negate some of the issues that the, that the offense had because they bailed us out by being so good. They're the most consistent team. They're arguably the most talented team. So, yes, to me, they're the best team, and everywhere else you look, there's flaws. I think Dallas has been the next most consistent team. Philadelphia has really struggled in that department on both sides of the football. Minnesota, is, who knows what they're going to look like. The Saints, the Bucks, you never know what you're going to get from, from, their, from a consistency standpoint there. I think the Lions are, are fairly consistent, but you see some of the, the – you know, some of the issues that they have, whether it's giving up some big plays, it, whether it's play calling, whether it's aggressiveness, whatever problems that they might run into, everybody's got an issue. And to me, the Niners have the fewest amount of flaws and they show up the fewest amount of times. Uh, yeah, speaking of, you know, issues and flaws there, I mean, obviously, I, I absolutely agree with you, Adam. They definitely have the fewest amount of problems. But as we get into the playoffs here, what if there was anything that could slip the slip up, cause the Niners to slip up in the playoffs? What is the one thing or the one or two things that should maybe concern 49ers fans uh, as these playoffs start up that could be the reason why the Niners don't make it all the way? Hmm. You know, I think some of the injuries on the back end on defense are are a little concerning. Um, obviously, the loss of Hufanga was brutal. Brutal. You know, they didn't really missed Jair Brown the other day, but, you know, I, I, he's got to be healthy. You know, he's played really well since uh, Hufanga got hurt. I have some questions about the corners, like Ambry Thomas is still a young corner, you know, third year. He's dealt with some injury this year, but more importantly, he's a young corner. They've had injuries at their nickel. Like, is Isaiah Oliver going to be consistent? Is Amador Lenore going to be consistent? Some of the plays that they've given up, I think, have been an issue at times. Their pass defense is probably their weak link. On the defensive side, obviously the run defense is excellent. Their linebackers are outstanding. I think Warner and Greenlaw are probably one of the best linebacker duos in the NFL just based on how quickly they get to the ball, how quickly they sniff certain things out. Uh, I love their front when they're healthy. Obviously, you know, if Armstead comes back, you know, for the playoffs and and is healthy and ready to go, that will be a huge boon to them. We know about Bosa and Young and, and the edge guys. I think the pass defense might be the one concern. And big plays are what the term, what, what oftentimes end up determining playoff games, right? Because again, it's a one shot game. So if you have like your best game of the year in terms of explosives and your defense takes the ball away, you know, one extra time and takes the possession away, now you're, you're putting a team, you know, putting an opponent into a really bad spot. So that's my one concern. But like I said, it's, it's, it's a very, you know, low flaw, low problem team. And we still don't see a ton of issues. Plus, the amount of takeaways that the Niners have had this year that kind of negates some of the issues that we've seen in the past season. So that, that's where my eyes go. Well, and by the way, we have them on Sunday. 
So we'll probably discuss, you know, a lot of this during the Rams game as well. Uh, there's not a whole lot of issues. That's one of the few things I look at and go, all right, maybe that's the problem come playoff time. Adam Amin joining us here on the Morning Rose, Joe Spadoni and Sam Lubbin in for Bonte Hill and Joe Shaskin. We appreciate the time, Adam, as you're traveling, obviously. You are also the television play-by-play voice for the Chicago Bulls. And real quick, I want to get you out on here on this one. Um, Zach Levine, Alex Caruso, these are names that a lot of Warriors fans have uh, you know, been doing the trade machine. Obviously, things aren't going well here in Golden State. Draymond Green, the indefinite suspension. What's going on with Andrew Wiggins, Clay Thompson? There's a lot of mess going on here. So a lot of fans are like, oh, what's going on with Zach Levine over there? He seems to be the eye of the NBA uh, trade world, if you will. Can you give us an update on uh, Zach Levine? And, uh, you know, is he potentially playing his last month here in uh, Chicago? You know, I think if you asked me this two and a half, three, four, you know, maybe three weeks ago, I would have said yes. I thought he was on his way out for sure. And again, I'm not basing this off of any discussion. This isn't like surprising inside info. This is just my gut feel reading the tea leaves, right? I feel like there was, you know, I would have said yes two and a half weeks ago or something like that. Now I don't, I don't feel that. And they don't have to make a, make a big move here, right? Because he's under contract. They're already, you know, they're, he's, he's slated to be here for another few seasons on that max deal. So it's not like you have to get rid of him. Like you look at DeMar DeRozan, he's on an expiring contract. So the idea of either signing him long term to an extension when he's you know getting into you know year fourteen fifteen now in the NBA is something you might you know pause at. Levine, you don't have to make a move if you don't want to. He's just gotten back underway with some cutting, uh, running around. He's 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 gotten back into the workout. Is he dealing with this right foot inflammation right now? The optics for the trade market for him aren't great. Although the OG on an OB trade does shift things a little bit because I feel like he's moved a little bit further up on a on a desire list for some organizations around the NBA. He's still one of the most dynamic scorers in the NBA when he's healthy. I, I, there's not a lot of guys who can do the things he does to get looks. Um, but I also feel like, you know, there's, there, there are some deficiencies like there are with a lot of players. Like he's still, you know, trying to figure out the feel. He's still trying to figure out when to attack, when to be more conservative. And that's something that, you know, when you're the lead guy and the pressure is on you, you, you don't really get a lot of chances to experiment unless it's in game. So there's still, I think a lot of learning for Zach to do, and he's on his way to doing that, or he was on his way to doing that, but you know, the injury has obviously slowed him down. So I imagine there's going to be a lot of organizations looking at him. Caruso's he's as desirable as any player in the league to me. I think he's been one of the two MVPs for the bulls this year. His defense is, you know, he was first team all defense last year. He's a high caliber player. He's on a very friendly contract right now. Uh, so the Bulls may not want to give him up unless they're going to get a haul back for him. I think that's kind of where both of those guys are at. Hey, Adam, appreciate the time, man. Uh, good luck on your call tonight uh, against the Sixers. And, uh, again, appreciate the time and Happy New Year. Appreciate you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. That is Adam Amin, who was on the call for Fox Sports as the Niners took out the Washington Commanders 27-10 there and had to sneak in a little NBA question, obviously.